We're good? Lights, camera, action? Okay. So, good evening, everyone. So, a shuffle. A yeah. shuffle. Would you like to start, Dr. Ho? Yeah, please. Uh, madam, can you tell us, Madam? Yes, I'm telling that Dr. Uh, J is the director of the film. <laughs> yeah, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Remote, what's <laughs> So, just wait. All right. Lights, camera, action. Okay. Okay, Paul. Okay. Doctor, Doctor um, Ashrafel Hook, would you yeah. like to welcome everyone? Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, dear ophthalmologist. We welcome you to all a special, very special event, a webinar, joint webinar organized by Bangladesh Young Ophthalmologist Society and Philippine Network of Young Ophthalmologists. The world is getting smaller by the network and the technology. And the COVID era has given us the opportunity to learn and share globally. So this webinar has designed not only what the Bangladesh and other side and Philippines are doing, what the global ophthalmologists are doing, we are sharing from Bangladesh to Philippines. And this will help us to build a better global ophthalmology community. So I am Dr. Ashraful Haq, President of Bangladesh Young Ophthalmology Society, will be moderate the session. And I welcome Dr. Charis Sanchez Tanlepko, the President of Philippine Network of Young Ophthalmologists, as co-moderator of this session. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Ashraful Haq. And again, thank you for having the idea of this joint webinar between Bangladesh and the Philippines. So this is a really nice way of learning new things not just about our common diseases, but it also enlightens us about each other's cultures as well. And again, the world isn't so big anymore. This pandemic has taught us that, you know, we can, we can do great things even, even with the distance, even, even with the lockdowns. So let's start. Would you like to introduce Thank our you. chief and special guests? Thank you, Chair. And today our topic is the subspecialty activities by young ophthalmologists. At the very first, I would like to introduce our chief guest, who needs no introduction. She is the teacher of our teachers. She is the president-elect of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. She is the advisor and past president of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh. She is the, she is the director and chief consultant of OSBI Hospital. And more importantly, she is the chief patron of Bangladesh Young Ophthalmologist Society. We welcome our chief guest, Professor Ava Hussein. And we welcome our special guest of this session, Professor Muhammad Sharfuddin Ahmed, our leader of the Bangladeshi ophthalmologist. He is the president of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh, and he is the chairman of Community Ophthalmology Department of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. And most importantly, he is the patron of Bangladesh Young Ophthalmologist Society. So over to you, Che. Okay, so um, good evening, Dr. Hussein and Dr. Ahmed. So I'm uh, it's also uh, us, and from the Philippines, I am delighted to introduce the president of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology, Dr. Margarita Lat Luna. Um, she is also a member of the board of directors of the Philippine Glaucoma Society and also deputy director for fiscal services at the Philippine General Hospital. So she's also an active teacher, so she's an associate. Professor of the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. So another special guest from the Philippines is Dr. Sherman Valero. He is a past president of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Philippine Board of Ophthalmology. He is also a member of the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Committees on Leadership Development and Young Ophthalmologists. So. We have, so welcome, thank you, thank you to our chief guests and to our special guests for, um, for, for coming, for attending. So we'd like to hear nice words yes. from you. Welcome, yes, um, uh, Dr. Margarita from, and Dr. Valero. I would like to invite first Professor Muhammad Sharfuddin Ahmed, sir, to say a few words about the webinar. Sharfuddin, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraful Hawk and Dr. Uh, Ten Lap Co uh, from Philippine, uh, uh, Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Abha Hussain. Uh, he is the President-elect Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and she is our guardian. 
she is a uh, guardian of all asia pacific uh, region uh, uh, among the ophthalmologists and uh, she is here as the chief guest i am very much honored with he, her i am the special guest and along with me uh, all other special guests from uh, philippines uh, i uh, congratulate all of the speakers as well as the panelists who are here with, in this uh, august gathering and uh, i hope young ophthalmologists of bangladesh and philippines they will work together not only uh, in the screen they will work in their uh, teaching in their academic activities their uh, uh, they will serve the patients uh, totally they can have the joint to work in research work during this covid period there is many things to learn and many things to do you know in uh, the covid uh, pandemic in our country we are not in a position to uh, reduce the backlog in cataract and you know that uh, there are lot of burden is being increased how we can combat and how this can be mitigated uh, with the conversation with philippine and bangladesh that can also be uh, uh, maintained by this young ophthalmologist of both the countries and you all know that uh, the operations as well as the uh, uh, wuhan in wuhan uh, there was a problem you all know that uh, first the ophthalmologist he has uh, li wei lang he introduced first himself as he uh, detected the first man abnormal virus and one ophthalmologist we are grateful to uh, his activities but uh, as he has already left the world uh, he uh, well, he died uh, we respect to him and as a ophthalmologist we will work together and we will protect ourselves during the practicing hours during uh, uh, operation and also during our consultancy so i hope uh, this should be our motto and uh, philippine and bangladesh will work together regarding this treatment latest treatment research work and also uh, in future when covid pandemic will be uh, off we will uh, be physically will meet in each other in both the country i wish all the success of this webinar and the organizers i thank the organizers who has uh, initiated this type of very excellent webinar uh, thanks to ashtaful thanks to uh, ten lapko and all others who are attending today thank you very much thank you sir and now i'd like to hear some uh, from some inspirational words from dr uh, Marge Latluna, the president of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology. Unmute. Marge, you can't hear you. She can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Unmute. Unmute. Okay, unmute the. Yes. There. There. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Professor Ava Hossein, Professor Dr. Sharfuddin Ahmed, Dr. Sherman Valero, our esteemed panelists and speakers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening here in Manila. Good afternoon in Bangladesh. On behalf of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology, I would like to extend to the organizers of this joint webinar our heartfelt gratitude and warm wishes. The Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology is celebrating its 75th year of organized ophthalmology practice in our country. We were supposed to celebrate it in the usual festive Filipino way, but we had to set aside some of the preparations that were started as early as last year. We had to contend with listening to lectures via live streaming. Although we missed the camaraderie um, that marked our reunions with our friends and colleagues, the online interactions served as opportunities to meet new friends and strengthen ties. It is with this renewed hope that we look forward to more collaborations with the Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh 
and the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. In the Philippines, we are not content with celebrating Christmas on December 25. We celebrate it during the entire month of December. So please accept our very humble gifts of prayers for everyone's safety and good health. Yuletide greetings and congratulations to all of you. Mabuhay and thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Luna. And now I'd like to hear some words from Dr. Sherman Valero. Hello, good evening. Past president of the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology. Hi. Good evening, sir. Good evening, um, Professor Ava Hussain, President-Elect of the Asia-Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, Professor Ahmed, uh, President of the Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh, Dr. Margarita Lat Luna, President of the PAO, and of course, to all our young ophthalmologists and their mentors from both Bangladesh and the Philippines, uh, good day. It's a great honor for me to be with you today to participate in this collaboration between the young ophthalmologists of our two countries. Years ago, the Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology attempted to embark on putting up YO activities. At that time, it was limited to sessions in our annual uh, meeting discussing issues such as choosing a fellowship program, finding a mentor, improving your cataract surgeries, starting your practice, sometimes even accounting and investments. It went on for a few years and was very well received. However, at some point, it became clear that it was not sustainable. These activities were not always the priority. It was subject to the vision and direction of whoever from the leadership was in charge. We were not the primary stakeholders, meaning us more senior ophthalmologists, and we don't have the pulse of what was important to our younger colleagues. Thankfully, our current leadership decided to allow our young ophthalmologists to organize themselves, assigning actual young ophthalmologists and not old fogies like us uh, to define the mission, vision, and strategic objectives of the group and carry out their projects. One important lesson is that mobilization and organization are infinitely made easier when the people involved are the stakeholders themselves. But I think it doesn't stop there. Even if you're able to mobilize, there can still be some resistance. In fact, I remember that when this uh, Philippine network of young ophthalmologists was formed and they embarked on their first project, there were actually questions going around like, why is there a need for a YO group? Why the need to differentiate between young and old? Why the need to create a divide between the young and the old ophthalmologists? What's the hidden agenda? In short, the formation of this group was met with some suspicious eyes. I credit this group for persevering and not playing into what I call generational politics. I always maintain that YOs or young ophthalmologists have very different concerns than us more senior members of the organization. And YOs now have different concerns from the YOs of my time. We should also recognize that they have a different set of challenges facing them and that helping them conquer these challenges will be for the betterment of not just them, but the entire organization. Just as importantly, they have a different set of talents and skills than us. An example will be the ease by which they can harness technology con to conceptualize and roll out projects like this one. Technology that can be used to improve organization, collaboration, and cooperation. Not to mention the fact, of course, that they still have the idealism and the energy to make things happen. I would like to congratulate the young ophthalmologists from both Bangladesh and the Philippines for starting these fruitful endeavors very early on in their professional lives. And if this is any indication of what we have to look forward to in the future, I think that our profession will be in very good hands. Finally, my congratulations for the moving forces behind this activity, Dr. Hook and Dr. Tanlapko, who I know worked very hard to make this activity happen. Once again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Valero. So now we will move to the main session of this webinar. And I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Masudul Hassan for his talk. He will be talking about the surgical management of ectatic cornea. Dr. Masudul Hassan, he is the consultant cornea and refractive surgeon of Vision Eye Hospital, Dhaka. Dr. Masud, please share your screen.
good evening everybody respected uh, chief guest honorable special guest and uh, my respected panelist and all participants welcome everybody to this international webinar and i am dr masudul hasan with kind permission from our respected chief guest i would like to start my topics on surgical management of ectopic cornea ectopic cornea is the condition leading to thinning and protrusion of the and protrusion of the cornea that leads to distorted and decrease the visual acuity especially keratoconus keratoglobus pellucid marginal degeneration and following refractive surgery why ectopic disease are so important because the ectopic condition the prevalence is high and 15 to 230 per 1 lakh population cannot be refracted by 2020 vision and scarring sometime unavoidable and early onset and it is also important because some systemic and ocular association with ectopic cornea like atopic disease down syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome mitral valve prolapse and marfan syndrome and some ocular disease is uh, associated with ectopic cornea like vernal conjunctivitis retinitis pigmentosa liver congenital amaurosis retinopathy of prematurity and fuchs endothelial dystrophy and before the surgical management i uh, confirm the diagnosis by following tools especially keratometry corneal topography pachymetry pentacam antro segment oct and recently we used ocular response analyzer for corneal hysteresis and corneal resistance especially antro segment oct is the very important tools for corneal thickness and architecture of the cornea and this is the pachymetry reading and ultrasonic pachymetry is the more uh, accurate for the uh, keratoconus or ectopic patient and ocular response analyzer who gives the important uh, findings about the corneal resistance and progression of the cornea especially corneal hysteresis less than 10 is significant and surgical treatment especially corneal cross linking intracorneal ring segment insert lenticular refractive surgery and corneal transplantation corneal collagen cross linking is the most recent addition to surgical management and it may slow or halt the prognosis progressions with photooxidative treatment to increase the rigidity of the cornea 60 to 70% patient show some stability following this treatment we prefer the cross linking in case of uh, epithelium on and epithelium off if the corneal thickness is more than 450 we use isotonic riboflavin with uh, corneal epithelium off procedures and if the corneal thickness is less than 450 micron then we use epithelium on procedures and the significantly corneal uh, ectopic condition Uh, uh significantly increase the visual acuity on or two lines in early to moderate cases and it is very much promising for the ectopic patient especially keratoconus and the best corrected visual acuity is significantly improved on or two lines in case of epithelium of patients and both the keratometry reading and the uh, progression of the keratoconus is significantly increased after the corneal collagen cross linking and intracorneal ring segment insert is the ideal for uh, 
mild to moderate keratoconus and the patient with contact lens intolerance but to achieve the desired effect cornea should be at least 450 micron keratoplasty is the recommended when cornea is scarring and after the acute high drops and very advanced corneal ectatic condition especially deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty and penetrating keratoplasty we perform in our center actually deep anterior keratoplasty is promising for the keratoconus patient i always use uh, big bubble technique and deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty is uh, very much uh, promising for the ectatic condition and we use uh, same donor and recipient size to decrease the uh, post operative myopic conditions of the cornea and penetrating keratoplasty is the ultimate goal when the cornea ectatic condition is advanced and there is no other alternate option when decimates membrane and acute hydrops is occur so we prefer uh, intrafted or continuous sutureing for the uh, keratoplasty penetrating keratoplasty and in case of keratoglobus the surgical management is so difficult but sometimes we perform lamellar graft but rejection rate is so high alicid marginal degeneration the surgical uh, technique we used large diameter or eccentric penetrating keratoplasty but rejection mode is uh, rejection rate is high like 64% post refractive corneal ectatic condition in case of study shows that uh, out of 77 patient 58 patient was uh, formi fosti keratoconus and 21.4% in others risk factor and 21.4% have no ectatic risk factor but it is remarkable that more than 75 micron ablation is the most risk factor so in this in our uh, institute we prefer lasik extra for any risk factor regarding formi fosti keratoconus post operative visual stability and management visual rehabilitation after stabilize the progression of the ectatic condition especially keratoconus we prefer spectacle in our mild to moderate case rigid gas permeable contact lens moderate to advanced case and rose k and scleral or mini scleral lens and another option i practice my two patient uh, uh, facic intraocular lens in case of uh, aged person uh, 35 years we perform the facic card facic lens and after the toric marking the refractive power was uh, minus 10 and cylindrical power was 7.5 at smart toric ipcl i prefer and patient is uh, now uh, very much happy with 618 dcpa and patient is happy and the keratoconus is held up for the stabilized with the aging process and the patient is now 618 vision without any spectacles so thank you very much everybody and uh, i would like to conclude my presentation and from my respected panelist i would like to uh, thanks again and remarkable suggestion for me is Uh, appreciable thank you thank you very much thank you dr masood it was a nice presentation on management of ectatic corneal disorder now i'd like to invite professor mohammad abdul kader for the panelist talk professor mohammad abdul kader he is the secretary general of ophthalmological society of bangladesh he is the secretary general of bangladesh cornea and refractive society 
and most importantly, he is the advisor of Bangladesh Young Ophthalmology Society. So over to you, Dr. Abdul Kadir, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good evening and good evening, everybody. Uh, it is my great honor and I feel delighted very much to be here with you in such a great uh, web joint webinar, Filipino uh, Network of Young Ophthalmologists and Bangladesh Young Ophthalmologist Society. Uh, the presentation of Dr. Masudur Hassan is very good. He's well prepared and he's doing very well. Uh, in the management of surgical management of Practitia is very much complicated because the decision is the main thing to when to do the surgery and which surgery is the applicable. The collagen cross linking is the hope for the ectatic patient. It is very good and very appreciable result after doing this surgery. We are doing very well in Bangladesh collagen cross linking in ectatic patient. When collagen cross linking is not applicable or contact lens or other medical option is not suitable for the treatment, then we go for the surgery. The first thing is, first surgery is deep anterior laminar keratoplasty. This is a good surgery and it is doing very well and patient is very much happy and result is very good. Another thing, when there is no scope for doing this type of surgery is because of uh, corneal scar, then we go for peritoneal keratoplasty. This is conventional keratoplasty. This is also good. But the problem is in Bangladesh, the cornea collection is very much poor. So we are not very much happy to this collection and we are not very much uh, in number of doing this type of keratoplasty. We also uh, uh, import cornea from outside of Bangladesh. So this is the shortcomings of in Bangladesh. So I, 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 I like to thank uh, Dr. Um, Ashrapul Haq, Dr. Cherish to uh, organize this type of webinar. It is very great opportunity for both countries to share their views and uh, uh, share their knowledge. And thank you very much. This is from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, very nice insight. So now um, it's our turn. So I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues because I'm also an oculoplastic surgeon. So here to discuss about upper eyelid reconstruction with or orbicularis bandage technique is my colleague, Dr. Armida Soler. She, is an, uh, she, she was trained under the in fellowship in um, oculoplastics at Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute. She's presently a clinical associate professor and consultant at the Plastic Lacrimal Service of the UPPGH. And to react to her um, lecture would be our boss, Dr. Alexander Tan. She's the chief of the Plastic Lacrimal Service of BG, uh, UPPGH. And he is Harvard trained, so he's also the past president of the Philippine Society of Thalmic, of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. So, um, Dr. Soler, would you like to share your slides already? Okay, let me just uh, share my screen, my slides, my presentation. So there, can you see my slides? There, yes. Okay, can you hear Take me? Take it Ming. <laughs> yes, yes, we're very clear. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and good evening to all of you. I would like to thank Pinoy and BYOS for the opportunity to present case studies on upper eyelid reconstruction using the orbicularis sandwich technique. Okay, so the first... Wait, let me just go back. The first case is a 57-year-old female who presented with a one-year history of progressively enlarging firm painless mass on the right upper eyelid. This was accompanied by blurring of vision of the right eye. There was no history of trauma or prior ocular eyelid or orbital surgeries. The past medical history and family history were unremarkable. The visual acuity on the right eye was 20-25, 
corrected to 2020. On the left, it was 2020. The extraocular motility was full. The pupils were normal with no REPD. The anterior and posterior segments were both unremarkable. On gross examination, there was a 15 by 15 millimeter round, firm, fixed, non-tender subcutaneous mass on the right upper eyelid. The angiectasia was noted on the inferior portion of the mass as well. There was no cervical lymph node enlargement. There was mechanical ptosis of the right upper eyelid. On upper eyelid diversion, there was a 17 by 18 millimeter cream-colored irregular broad-based mass on the portable conjunctiva. There was a loss of eyelashes on the area where the mass disrupts the normal, uh, the normal eyelid margin contour. Our initial diagnosis was a right upper eyelid malignancy, which can either be a squamous cell carcinoma or a sebaceous carcinoma. We did an incisional biopsy, and the lesion turned out to be sebaceous carcinoma. We then performed wide excision of the tumor with 3 mm margins, intraoperative frozen section control, and eyelid reconstruction. Since the lesion involved the posterior lamella and eyelid margin, a full thickness eyelid excision was carried out. So by just eyeballing the lesion and adding the margins, we know that the resulting defect will involve more than 50% of the eyelid length. There are several options in reconstructing large full thickness defects of the upper eyelid. I'm sure that you're all familiar with the reconstructive ladder found in AAO. Remember that full thickness eyelid defects require replacement of both the anterior and posterior lamellae. Common options in reconstruction include free tars of conjunctival graft with myofitinous flap, the cutler beard procedure, the lower eyelid switch flap, and median forehead flap. At our institution, our preference is the orbiculary sandwich technique. The orbiculary sandwich technique was introduced by Dr. Franklin T. Kleiner at the Philippine General Hospital in 2004. In this procedure, a bipedicled orbicularis muscle flap, which serves as the vascular bed, is sandwiched between two free grafts, a free tars conjunctival graft posteriorly, and a full thickness skin graft anteriorly. After tumor excision, the horizontal upper eyelid defect is measured. A free tarsal conjunctival graft is harvested from the contralateral upper eyelid. The free tarsal conjunctival graft is then sutured to the upper eyelid defect using six ovicule sutures. The bipedical flap is created by dissecting the orbicularis muscle from the skin and orbital septum. The flap is advanced and sutured to the tarsal conjunctival graft using six ovicule sutures. A full thickness skin graft is harvested from the contralateral upper eyelid or post-auricular or supraclavicular areas and is then sutured to the orbicularis muscle flap and remaining eyelid skin using 6 O silk sutures. The sorophy is performed and the bolster is placed, which is removed after 7 days. The tarsorophy is not opened until 6 to 8 weeks post-operatively to keep the reconstructed eyelid in stretch and prevent upper eyelid retraction. This is the appearance of the patient at six months postoperatively. A good eyelid contour is achieved and there is no lag of foulness. This is another patient who had a two-month history of progressively enlarging right upper eyelid mass. It was difficult to avert the eyelid on examination. In stational life, she revealed fully differentiated carcinoma. She eventually underwent wide excision with eyelid reconstruction using the orbicularis sandwich technique. The photo on your right shows the appearance of the patient at 10 months postoperatively with good cosmetic and functional outcomes. This 68-year-old male patient had squamous cell carcinoma of the left upper eyelid. He underwent wide excision of the mass and reconstruction of the eyelid using the orbicularis sandwich technique. In addition to a free tarsal conjunctival graft, a lateral periosteal flap was used to reconstruct the posterior lamella as well. The photo on your right shows the appearance of the patient at two months postoperatively. The use of orbicularis flap in eyelid reconstruction has several advantages. The extensive blood supply of the orbicularis muscle provides an excellent vascular bed for feet, tarsal conjunctival, and skin drafts. Mobilized orbicularis muscle enhances the mobility of the reconstructed eyelid. Thinner skin improves eyelid closure, mobility, and cosmesis. Orbicularis is easier to harvest than a skin muscle flap which can be bulky as it can be readily stretched and requires 
minimal donor site closure. One of the problems that we encountered early on was upper eyelid retraction. To prevent this problem, we now performed our sorophy on all of our cases. Notching of the eyelid margin and thickening of the skin graft can also occur. Other reported complications in the literature include atrophion, partial graft necrosis, corneal abrasions, and granuloma. In summary, I have presented cases which demonstrate these four of the orcularis sandwich technique in reconstructing large full thickness upper eyelid defects. And lastly, do not forget to avert the eyelid because even if the mass initially looks subcutaneous and benign, you might be surprised to find a larger or malignant lesion hiding underneath. Thank you for listening. I would like to thank Dr. Sena Duco, Dr. Sobre, Dr. Gungab, and Dr. Laksamana for providing some of the photos used in the stock. Thank you. Amazing work, Ming. So we'd like to um, hear from our boss, Dr. Alexander Tan, for his reaction. Violent reaction. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Anlapo, for your invitation. Uh, I'd like to say good evening to all the young ophthalmologists from Bangladesh and the Philippines. Um, Dr. Anasoler um, gave a very nice report on the orbicularis uh, sandwich technique in reconstruction of the upper eyelid. Now in the time of COVID, I would imagine that um, a lot of patients with tumors uh, are not coming in for their consultations. So I think it's very important for us ophthalmologists to have a high index of suspicion in dealing with patients complaining of uh, eyelid masses. And with, re with regards to reconstruction, we always uh, want to do simple surgery because uh, we never really know if the tumor will come back. We want to be able to, we want to be ready for a second or maybe like a third surgery for our patients. So it's important to know the different options available and the advantages and disadvantages of each procedure. Also, um, it's not just about the surgery. It's also about preoperative preparation. For example, if you're thinking of doing an orbicularis sandwich technique, it's very important that you have a good vascular supply for your orbicularis. For example, if your patient has undergone uh, radiation therapy or has had uh, extensive trauma, the vascularity might be compromised. And also important is uh, post-operative wound care. So it's important to follow up these patients until the wounds are mature for maybe around uh, two to three months. All right, thank you. And um, again, thank you for the invitation, Dr. Tanlapko. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so nice thank to see everybody. It's like uh, traveling to another country. <laughs> thank yes. you, Dr. Tan. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Tan. Hope after the COVID pandemic, we'll invite you all to Bangladesh. Oh, we're, we're going to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will move to our next presentation. So now we are moving to cataract. So for cataract, I would like to invite Dr. Roxanda Renuma. She will be presenting on fight against the white. White, how we fight and how we manage the white cataract. Dr. Roxanda Renuma, she is the consultant of Bangladesh Eye Care Hospital. Dr. Roxanda, please share your screen. Let's share your screen. Yeah. Can you see? Uh, it's still not visible. Yeah, it's visible now. OK. Uh, Full screen. Yeah. Is it OK now? Yes, perfect. So, good evening, everyone. Thanks to Bangladesh Young Ophthalmology Society and Pinoy for inviting me and giving me the plot. Today, I will talk about fight against white, uh, which where I will tell the story how I overcame doing this white cataract surgery and was successful. And that will be the suggestion, suggestions for the beginners also. 
So white cataract itself has a wide variety. Uh, it's like an iceberg. We don't know what's inside or what's beneath. So what to do? So preoperative evaluation is very important here. We have to look for any ocular comorbidities associated with this white type of cataract and identification and type and grade of the cataract is very much important. Today, I will focus only the white part of cataract, not with associated ocular comorbidities. So in preoperative investigation, along with biometry, we have to do B scan as we cannot see the posterior, fund, posterior segment here. And we have to counsel with our patients in detail. We have to be prepared with all of our weapons uh, to fight, uh, to combat this white cataract. But many of us may be the fan of this flag, but in case of uh, white cataract surgery, it's uh, a nightmare and we wa do not want to see this flag sign here. So this is the most common complication in case of white cataract surgery. So in short, uh, we can categorize this white cataract into solid white cataract where all the uh, whole nucleus is solid and it has a yellowish hue. But in case of pearly white cataract, there are some liquefied material and some are solid. And in case of milky white cataract, almost all the materials are liquefied here. Both of them has a bluish or whitish uh, hue. So in case of solid white cataract, the capsulorexis is relatively easier and uh, so we can continue the capsulorexis as usual manner. But in case of pearly white cataract, this is the most dangerous type. Just after doing the puncture, the liquefied material will come out and the solid part will create pressure and cause radialization of the capsule. In case of milky white cataract, it is relatively safer as the li liquefied material will come out. There is nothing solid part to pre create pressure. So to keep the AC stable, uh, I do the main port first instead of side port only, uh, uh, which will keep the anterior chamber stable. As it is uh, white against white and there is no fundal glow, so I stain the capsule a little bit more to make it blue against white. I use ophthalmic viscoelastic very meticulously, preferably dispersive viscoelastic to keep the uh, capsule uh, controlled to keep the AC stable. And as I said, today I will tell my story. So I prefer to do double rexis technique, uh, but you have to keep patience here because lots of liquefied material will come out again and again. And you have to keep ophthalmic viscoelastic device injecting again and again. And don't do anything uh, without a proper visualization. Don't do anything blindly. Uh, you have to... Uh, put the ophthalmic viscoelastic device when the liquefied material will come out and then you can successfully do the capsulorexis, uh, primary capsulorexis here. So after doing the primary capsulorexis, don't forget to tap and release the intralenticular pressure. This step is very much important because I learned it from mistake. I just after doing uh, capsulorexis, I cut for the secondary capsulorexis and this happened because I did not tap in my initial stage. So now the secondary rexis. After doing the successful primary capsulorexis, you have to cut at the side of the primary rexis just to make an acute angle to elevate the flap and then you can continue the capsulorexis as usual manner. Keep ophthalmic viscoelastic device uh, and do the successful capsulorexis here. So what I mentioned, cut this here at the side of the primary capsulorexis to make an acute angle, not the here, because this can cause extension of the flap towards periphery. So as I mentioned that in case of solid white cataract, you can capsule, continue capsulorexis as the usual manner, just keep the flap uh, flat so that you can continue the capsulorexis. You can also uh, create the capsular, uh, do the capsulorexis in a spiral manner just after doing ele uh, elevating the primary flap uh, and uh, releasing the intralenticular pressure. You can continue the capsulorexis in a spiral or serpentile or orange peel manner. This technique has many names. So in case of fibrotic capsule management, there is actually no rule. The only rule here is cut the fibrous, cut the capsule where the fibrous part is and try to keep it continuous so that we can uh, finish the surgery uneventfully. 
So in case of white cataract, uh, uh, solid white cataract, do little hydro, but in case of liquefied and more pearly white cataract or uh, milky white cataract, no need to do hydro. Uh, in case of hard cataract, I do the deep and wide trench. It make me, makes me to do chop more easily and separate the central part more easily. In, uh, but remember, in case of solid white cataract, if it is leathery white, then separate, the, separate it layer by layer and completely separate all the pieces because if you do not this, you will face difficulty during quadrant removal. Now in Morgagnian cataract, do not remove all the liquefied material here because this liquefied material will serve as cushion and help you to do sculpting more easily and prevent unwanted rotation here. This liquefied material will be removed automatically over time. And in case of small uh, Morgagnian cataract, the small keep, big, uh, keep bring the, this small uh, part at the center and do chop. Then do chop, uh, it will keep the posterior capsule safe. In case of quadrant removal, my suggestion is try to do chop, chop and chop and uh, do uh, make as many pieces as you can, especially for hard type of cataract and fibrous type, leathery type of cataract. And uh, my suggestion is again, check the parameters before doing chop and before doing the quadrant removal and set the parameters according to the grade of the cataract. Now, this is the usual scenario after removal of the uh, so nuclear part, this is, there are not, not much uh, cortical material here, only the tiny fibers here. This is the usual scenario. Sometimes these cortical materials are adamant to come out with cortex removal mode. So you can use the polish mode to remove these tiny fibers. But for the beginners, my suggestion is don't try to remove these fibers with polish at the very beginning. So tips to win the fight is, do the main port first instead of side port to keep the AC stable. Stain the capsule a little bit more. Use dispersive viscoelastic to keep AC stable. You can do any follow any uh, type of rexis, double rexis or spiral rexis or aspiration, whatever makes you comfortable. Tap to release the intralenticular pressure. In case of hard cataract, deep and wide trench help you to do chop more easily. In case of Morgagnian cataract, bring the piece at the center and then do chop. It will uh, cause uh, keep the posterior capsule safe. <coughs> So in short, these are the tips for, uh, for, from my side. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Raksanda. It is an excellent presentation. So now it comes to the mentor stock. So why I'm calling it mentor stock? Because now I'm inviting the one person with whom we learn our FECO surgery. He is our cataract surgery mentor and in the fellowship program. I would like to invite Professor Muhammad Nazrul Islam he is the present president of Bangladesh Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeon and he is the past president of Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. Nuzul, sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf, for the kind invitation in this beautiful webinar by the young ophthalmologist. And you have seen very nicely Dr. Roksanda presented her presentation. And we are very happy that our chief guest, Professor Abha Hussain, who is with us, my teacher, you know, all of you know her and a special guest from Bangladesh, from Philippines, and my good friend, Dr. Norman Aquino is also with us here, and all the honorable panelists and speakers. Actually, it was nice to listen from our students. And Roxanda Renuma is our student, uh, not many days, but she has learned so nicely within few months and few years. She is really proud of us. And what she described about the white cataract is, I think uh, already she has covered most of the topics, most of the part, how we should actually uh, preoperatively patient counseling, patient selection, and paraoperative. She has already mentioned. Few things I like to add that uh, preoperatively we must see the patient more meticulously because this patient might have small people, this patient might have genular dehiscence, this patient. The cataract also, already she has mentioned, this is intumescent cataract, this is a soft cataract, this is a sandy cataract, or this is really very hard cataract, or the Morgagnian cataract. This is really important. Our operative, she has also mentioned, if it's an intumescent cataract, that really causes problem. 
that is reproduces the argentine and plaque sign so in that cases many people utilizes many ways to do capsulorexis some people uses needle rexis some people use punctorexis some spiral way of capsulorexis and already she mentioned the double rexis and in my practice for last 20 years i do this double rexis and i find it is really reproducible you can do in all cases of your white intumescent cataract regarding the heart cataract she has rightly mentioned that you can do if it is send is fine other you can go layer by layer but one thing i can add here in my practice i have seen that you can also use the ivel scaffold technique in the heart cataract because in some cases we find the cataract is very hard and the pieces of the nucleus like a knife and any time there is no cushion there is no epinuclear material here so any time this nucleus may cause your postural capsule tear so we can um, make a ivel scaffold protect your postural capsule but definitely important is you have to protect your cornea also by giving frequent dispersive discolastic so this way you can have your good life this is very important and lastly i would like to say that in this cases sometimes if you find there's a lot of zonular dehiscence you cannot manage with the absorption ring or the segment then definitely you can go for the sics because small intestinal cataracts are there sometimes you are you will be able to bring your nucleus and then you put your capsular tension ring and the segment ring and put your ivel this is really nice and finally in some very rare cases when zonular dehiscence is more than 2/3 you have to bring all the nucleus all the cortex and put your secondary ivel implant in this sort of cases so i am really proud to see our our juniors our young doctors our young surgeons doing so good surgery and similarly like philippine also i know some of you have shown very nice your presentation i have seen really we enjoyed it and thank you very much dr ashraf and dr che for inviting me in this beautiful webinar thank you very much thank you sir so now let's uh okay and now our next presentation will be from the philippines um it will be about bleb dysesthesia our Speaker is Dr. Jessa Protasio. She had her fellowship in glaucoma at the Philippine General Hospital, and then proceeded to the Netherlands for uh, no, for to Ireland for uh, further training. She's presently a glaucoma consultant at the Davao Doctors Hospital, and then our panelist will be his or uh, her mentor, Dr. Norman Aquino. Um, he. Dr. Aquino is presently the chief of the glaucoma service of the Philippine General Hospital. He is also the past president of the Philippine Glaucoma Society, and as I mentioned earlier, he is also the secretary general of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. So, Jessa, would you like to share your slides now? Jessa, are you there? Yes, <laughs> yes <I'm> there. there. <laughs> Let me just. Yeah, can you see it? Yes, yeah. Jessa. You okay. may go ahead. All right. So good evening. I am Jessa Protasio, and I'm here to present the case of a 56-year-old female who underwent trabeculectomy with mitomycin C on the right eye for primary angle closure glaucoma. She was well, but at three months post-op, while her city was on lockdown due to the pandemic, she emailed me complaining of swelling, redness, and the sensation of something covering her vision. Uh, as shown in the picture, the conjunctiva inferiorly appeared swollen or boggy. I initially started her on preservative-free lubricants, but this did not give any relief. I also treated her actually for a possible allergic component, but this still did not resolve symptoms. I finally saw her at five months post-op, where I realized that the swollen conjunctiva inferiorly was actually an extension of my very diffuse bleb. The IOP was low at 5 mm mercury, but the rest of the examination was unremarkable. So I diagnosed this patient to have a dysesthetic circumferential bleb on the right eye. So bleb dysesthesia is a complication of glaucoma filtration surgery where a well-functioning but large bleb causes interrupted tear film distribution, resulting in pain, foreign body sensation, tearing, and reduced visual acuity. 
So these symptoms may sometimes appear disproportionate to clinical findings. Dysesthetic blebs may be associated with under or over filtration or excessive size. It may vary in appearance as in the pictures shown and various risk factors have been identified with those encircled in this slide present in my patient. So management involves alleviating discomfort while maintaining a functioning bleb with adequate IOP control. So the first-line conservative measure is intensive lubrication. If that doesn't work, other more aggressive measures can be done. Specific to the circumferential bleb, these include the application of photocoagulative laser, bleb window cryopexy, and bleb-limiting conjunctivoplasty. Uh, in the interest of time, I focus on the management technique I chose for my patient, which is the application of compression sutures. So these promote adherence of the conjunctiva to the underlying scleral tissue. The suture acts to effectively wall off that section of the bleb, preventing aqueous from moving past the suture. So the picture on the upper left uh, shows the classic Palmberg compression suture, but Different styles of suturing have since been advocated by various surgeons, all with the same principle. Palmberg himself reports an 80% success rate in the reduction of bleb dysesthesia with this, this technique. Advantages include um, that it is not as invasive uh, and it is reversible. And complications to watch out for are uh, listed on the slide. So back to the case, I placed two nylon 90 sutures in an X configuration on each side of the bleb uh, to promote scarring in this area and prevent inferior extension past these sutures. Uh, within the first post-op week, as you can see, the conjunctiva was hyperemic, the anterior chamber was shallow, and the intraocular pressure was still low at four. So the sutures are seen tied tightly over the bleb. Visual acuity deteriorated, which I attributed to a post-op refractive shift, astigmatism, inflammation, an increase in cataract density, and hypotony, although I could not visualize any macular folds or striae through the cataractus lens. I started her on atropine, and at the end of week one, I discontinued her steroids altogether to promote scarring. At five weeks post-op, uh, as seen in this picture, the right eye was still a bit hyperemic, but there was a decrease in subjective discomfort. Visual acuity was improved. The anterior chamber was deeper. IOP, however, was still for. At this point, my most nasal compression suture had loosened, which I removed at the slit lamp. At eight weeks post-op, there was no more foreign body sensation. Visual acuity was much improved at 2040, and the anterior chamber was deep. However, IOP suddenly spiked to 30 with a slightly localized mid-rise and vascular bleb. So at this point, I decided to cut the three remaining compression sutures and I restarted her on steroids. After one week, the eye was looking much better and the patient had no subjective complaints. However, intraocular pressure was still high at 31, going down to 23 on ocular massage with accompanying bleb rise. So I decided to do laser suture lysis of both flap sutures and accompanied with digital pressure, this brought down the IOP to 18. So I instructed the patient to start ocular massage or digital pressure at home. So the patient came in the following week with the inferior conjunctiva finally looking flat. IOP was much lower at 20 and uh, even went down to 16 when I did the massage myself. So I did want pressure to be lower because of her advanced visual field damage. So I presented to the patient the options of needling to further lower down the IOP versus starting her on uh, one maintenance medication. And she opted for the latter for uh, the convenience. So I started her on uh, Timolol two times per day. So this is actually still an evolving case and I'm due to see the patient again for follow-up by next week. So in summary, blood dysesthesia is a challenging post-operative complication. Uh, First-line management is extensive lubrication, and if that fails, a stepwise approach may be employed. What this case proves is that placing compression sutures is effective, but it might take some time before they work, so a little patience is uh, needed as well. So this case highlights the importance of watching the patient closely because um, unexpectedly pressure might rise uh, and timely intervention or manipulation is important to ensure uh, final success of the procedure. So while we as physicians may have our own preferences in the management of our patient, it is important to always take into consideration the patient's concerns and wishes. So thank you. Here are my references.
Thank you so much, Jessa. That's amazing work. Uh, Dr. Aquino, would you like to say something? Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Jessa for a very clear and concise presentation. I also would like to commend her for choosing such a case. You know, uh, it underscores the exciting life that a glaucoma surgeon really has with the many unpredictable turns that the surgery can lead to. All right. So no matter if you do uneventful, technically adequate surgery, there is no guarantee that that surgery is going to turn out the way you want it to turn out for the longest run. And therefore, to the young ophthalmologists who are beginning to do their glaucoma surgeries, my only advice is monitor your patients. After filtering surgery, don't take a look at them a week, a month after. Take a look at them for longer periods of time because as you go along the course of that eye, there will be many, many surprises that can pop up. And it is only through meticulous follow-up will you be able to catch all these complications as early as you can in order for you to treat that particular complication. All right? So you have to be on your toes every time. And whenever you stumble on a certain step, uh, I also advise the young ophthalmologist to seek help from their friends, from their mentors, simply because at this stage in your career, you might not have seen or experienced a lot of these things that you just read in the book. So there is no shame for you to call up a mentor, tell them what the case is, and listen to what he or she will have to say. It doesn't mean that you will have to blindly follow the advice, but certainly getting a new perspective of the case will really help you uh, learn and gain more experience and wisdom in managing your surprising glaucoma uh, surgeries. All right, so thank you. And again, congratulations to the organizers of this great event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aquino. Very, very nice words. Very true. I cannot agree with you more. So now, Ashrafel. Thank Dr. you, Jay. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Aquino, for your nice words. So now we will like to move to retina. So the surgery in diabetic retinopathy. So the diabetes has become the pandemic-like things. And in every family, there are one or two members are in diabetes patients. So with the diabetic retinopathy, so has its surgery become easier? I would like to invite Dr. Arif Hayatkan Patan to speak on these topics. Dr. Arif is the consultant retina specialist of Islamia Ispahani Eye Institute and Hospital, and he is also the executive member of Bangladesh Young Ophthalmology Society. So, Dr. Arif, can you please share your screen? Dr. Arif, can you please unmute yourself? Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, oh thank you very much. Uh, I am Dr. Muhammad Arif Hayat Khan Patan. Uh, I would like to show my gratitude and uh, thanks to all for inviting me in these uh, exciting events, uh, the uh, Young Ophthalmologist Subspecialty Works. I would like to say uh, my talk on surgery in diabetic retinopathy. All of you know that diabetic retinopathy is one of the uh, pandemic cause of the visual loss and uh, surgery of diabetic retinopathy is uh, really uh, challenging and exciting because surgical outcome not only depends on the surgical efficiency of the surgeons, but also depends on many things. And many patients come at the end stage or advanced stages in that times, the surgical outcome does not 
can give the much improvement of the vision. So previously, uh, many of our surgeons used to avoid the surgical uh, vitrectomy, but nowadays, because of advancements of the uh, diabetic sur vitrectomy surgical instruments, so we can uh, do even surgery in the advanced stages, and even the patients are getting good vision. So surgical outcome of diabetic retinopathy, uh, it uh, got much easier nowadays. So I would like to say on surgical bit, uh, diabetic vitrectomy. So uh, diabetic vitrectomy is the leading cause of uh, blindness. And uh, because of diabetic macular edema, it's 75% is responsible for this. And 25% of the patients with diabetic retinopathy goes to polyphatic diabetic retinopathy. And uh, I will not go uh, on the pathogenesis or the, some basics. I will go directly to my topics, that is the surgical outcome. So surgical outcome depends on many things. So uh, it usually depends on the status of the patients when he presented. If it is non-macular involving tractional lateral detachments or macular involving tractional lateral detachment with brief duration or presence of previous PRP, pandemic photocoagulation, or patient had a good systemic control. If this patient has these types of condition, then surgical outcome, outcome is relatively favorable, but surgical outcome is usually unfavorable or poor outcome. If there is Irish new vascularization, new vascular glaucoma, and there are extensive traction and, and the initial visual equity is less than five to 200. So, the, uh, but surgical outcome can be uh, uh, improved by giving preoperative uh, intravitreal vivacizumab. So it decreases the risk of in recurrent intravitreal hemorrhage. It also uh, uh, can be given in the neovascular glaucoma with rubiosis IDDs. Usually we give preoperative injection seven days prior to surgery, but surgery can be done any times so one to two, day, three days after giving injection. And it causes the improvement of the outcome by facilitating the surgical manipulation in diabetic tractional detachments. It also reduces the paraoperative bleeding and thus the surgical outcome uh, favors by preoperative giving injection, vivacizumab. And uh, a successful vitrectomy a system we need. And, uh, and nowadays, the recent advancement uh, has given, blessed us with a wide angle viewing system by which we can see the vessels, even the vessels of the retina and even the every parts of the retina very clearly. And the vitrectomy machine also gives us the opportunity to cut all the vitreous without doing any harm to the retina. So uh, the previously there was the old vitrectomy system that was we used 20 gauge vitrectomy system. In this 20 gauge vitrectomy system, the uh, probe was the large enough. It is about two in, and uh, the port was uh, large. So and in case in that cases uh, there was a chance of leak and infection uh, was sometimes very much common and the fluidics was difficult and we had to use our the cutter far from the retinal surface because the traction and suction was sometimes inevitable, inevitable that causing the iatrogenic retinal break. So, and the forceps and scissors were also required and um, for controlling the uh, hemorrhage, recurrent use of diathermy was needed. But Recently, uh, we are using micro incisional vitrectomy systems, that is MIVS. In that cases, we are using small gauge vitrectomy, that is 25 gauge, even 27 gauge. The smaller sclerotomy is used with smaller gauge instrumentation that improves intraocular pressure control, and also it is less intraoperative bleeding and therefore with less need for diathermy. And uh, even uh, after surgery, the suture was not needed and it causes the early recovery and patients sees better. So uh, 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 the role of vitrectomy in case of diabetic patients, I'm showing in this feature, in this, uh, uh, yeah. So it's cleared the media and it removes the, all the vitreous fibrotrity shown a hemorrhage. And also we can uh, minimize the bleeding by this. And it also avoids the iatrogenic break and retinotomies. And uh, after diabetic vitrectomy, we attach the retina and then we can go for pan retinal photocoagulation. And after that, we can give the tamponade. So uh, vitrectomy can uh, give the retina attached and then give a good vision. And uh, surgical outcome, good surgical outcome, uh, uh, in case of diabetes, which depends on the membrane dissections and that is segmentation and delamination. That is the removal of, removal of all the membrane that causing TRD. That is nicely 
can be done by the uh, recent uh, advancements of the vitrectomy system because the cutter are so small and sometimes they can cut the um, attached uh, membrane uh, with the retina without causing any harm to the retina. And uh, uh, the lift and shape technique uh, with the 27 gauge or 25 gauge vitrectomy is uh, very much uh, uh, essential. It uh, finds the dissection plane uh, in between the membrane and the uh, uh, retina. And, uh, and uh, by this, we can aspirate or lift the edge of the membrane and peel until without any resistance. And we can shave fibrovascular tissue from the vessels without causing any harm to the retina or iatrogenic break or hemorrhage. So this technique also gives a good uh, visual outcome or surgical outcome. And uh, uh, the most important thing is that the cutter can be used for multifunctional tool. Uh, it can be used for cutting, it can be used for lifting the membrane, it can be used uh, for uh, air fluid exchange and shaping technique. So the uh, all probe dissection techniques, uh, it has the economical and efficient benefit and uh, no other that we don't need any forceps, we don't need any pillar and uh, sometimes we don't need any scissor also. So and, 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 and by this, it reduces the operating time and reduce the bleeding and complications. And by through this, we can access tight tissue planes easily and uh, you can shave on the retinal surface, peel tissue safely by this uh, probe. And this also reduces movement and traction on the retina. And this, this again thinks that the retina uh, gets better uh, with these techniques. And the proportional reflux, it is another technique by which we can uh, go for uh, the suction port sometimes used to displace incarcerated tissue displaced uh, drop nucleus of the macula or movable foreign body of our macula. This also helps cutting the uh, membrane without damaging to the retina. And uh, subhyaloid, I'm showing one of the small videos that is subhyaloid hemorrhage. We are doing with these uh, 23 gauge vitrectomy systems. Just after removing, you see that uh, uh, the uh, posterior vitreous, uh, the, all the hemorrhage is sucked out and uh, we found that there was a there was a peritoneal membrane. So we decided to do ILM peeling in a peritoneal membrane. And uh, after giving dye, we removed the ILM peeling. And uh, after uh, this, uh, we did ER fluid exchange. So, and then did laser. So uh, diabetic vitrectomy uh, gives the good result in, in case of high load hemorrhage, even sometimes uh, 6669 visions. And another patients that is diabetic, uh, advanced diabetic eye disease with macular hole, we are doing this surgery. We was, uh, after removing the, all the vitreous and the hemorrhage, we found that there was a macular hole. After giving the dye, uh, we found that the hole is large enough. Then we decided to the ILM peel and we kept the, all the IL, uh, most, uh, the central ILM uh, about the uh, macular hole and the uh, inverted ILM peeling technique, we uh, finished the surgery. And uh, the most important thing is that this diabetic recent advancement uh, make the diabetic vitrectomy sutureless. If you see that uh, uh, we are using this uh, sutureless vitrectomy, uh, uh, and, uh, after this uh, vitrectomy, when a BTS vitrectomy is done, just we are closing the port, just removing the port without giving any sutures, and thus the eyeball was uh, white after surgery. So uh, it looks that the patient had minimum surgery. So uh, latest advancement of the diabetic vitrectomy sometimes gives the sutureless vitrectomy. So uh, in last, I want to say that diabetic vitrectomy uh, is not now in the previous stages. Now it goes much easier, and patients are uh, getting hope also because it gives new new array of wide angle viewing systems, contact or non-contact heads up and a new light sources and a new machines, new pumps, improved flow control, super high speed and also anti-VGF drugs also uh, improves the surgical outcome. So in conclusion, I want to say that the treatment of uh, tractional return adjustments or regmatogenical adjustments in case of diabetic retinopathy has improved significantly over the past four decades because of advancements of the latest technology and effective surgical management of these conditions remains challenging, but advancement of technology made the surgical challenge easier and effective. Um, no, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for passion sharing. Thank you, Dr. Arif. Thank you for the nice presentation. Now I would like to invite the expert panelists. I would like to invite Dr. Niaz Abdul Rahman. 
He is the president of Bangladesh Free Trade Retainers Society and a great mentor. And being an anterior segment surgeon, when I see his vitreoretinal surgery, I feel like learning the VR surgery. So, Dr. Nia, sir, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Ashraf. It is indeed uh, a real, I'm feeling thrilled to be in this group, to, you know, talk in your group, the young ophthalmologist. But I feel that I'm still very young. I want to join your group as a young ophthalmologist. Don't want to be in the older group, whatever it is. Uh, it's a great endeavor that you took. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Ashraf from this end and Dr. Uh, Chi, right, uh, fr from the Philippines. Uh, so uh, uh, all the talks were very nice. Now, as far as posterior segment surgery goes, when we started this many, many years ago, this was a difficult uh, subspecialty, mainly because of poor instrumentation. But as time went, and now in, in this millennium, the, as Dr. Uh, Patan was saying, that uh, Arif Patan was saying that the instrumentation has become so good that the surgery has become easier. And diabetic surgery, we, people used to avoid diabetic surgery. When even when I was a, a fellow back in the 90s, people used to avoid diabetic surgery because the outcome was so poor. But now I think... Diabetic vitrectomy is the most exciting surgery for a vitreoretinal surgeon. Timing is very crucial when you want to do it. And I always feel that a little earlier surgery will give you very good result. Don't wait for the membranes to form. If, if you have even if you've done pan retinal photocoagulation, if you see the vitreous is thickening, bands are forming, just go ahead and take the vitreous out because vitreous is the culprit. If there's no vitreous, you should have saved the eye. And uh, we have seen excellent surgery. Dr. Arif is, has become an excellent vitreoretinal surgeon. And I've watched him over the last few years. And very quickly he has come to a level that, you know, he's confident in doing all kinds of vitreoretinal surgery and all kinds of diabetic surgery. Thank you. Arif, sir. I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, apart from that, I want to say a few things, uh, uh, you know, what Dr. Aquino has also said that, you know, uh, the, the young ophthalmologists, you must remember that learning is a slow process. It's not like overnight you cannot learn. You keep on learning. I am still learning. I still learn vitrectomy. I still watch vitrectomies. Nowadays, there's a YouTube. I will watch YouTube videos whenever in a conference or somewhere I go, I will, I will still try to go into an operating room and watch a surgeon, what he does. And every time I watch someone, I learn something new. So for all the young ophthalmologists, in whichever subspecialty you are, remember that there's no end to learning and you must watch. If you're a surgeon, you watch other surgeons and choose a mentor, keep in touch with your mentor throughout your life. I still keep in touch with my professors, uh, you know, some of them are not there anymore because I did my fellowship so long ago, but I still keep in touch with my, my mentors. And some of my fellows whom I've trained in the last 15, 20 years, they keep in touch with me regularly. And every week I'll get a call from someone when they come to a difficult patient, they'll ask my advice. That is the advice I want to give to all the young ophthalmologists. Always keep in touch with your mentor because your mentor or teacher will always feel honored if you if you ask an, for an opinion from them and they will always be able to give you advice. It has become such that a one or two of my old fellows, now in a difficult case, I call them over to uh, as a consultant and we sit together and come to this decision. So that will even, that, that is the day when you are really happy. And uh, I was talking with Professor Ava Hossein a few days ago and she was saying that when is a teacher really happy, it is that when the student has, has surpassed the teacher as the time when, when the teacher is really happy. So, so you keep the I, one last advice I'm giving you is always keep in touch with, with your mentor and expose yourself to all newer things. Uh, again, I want to thank the Young Ophthalmologist Group. Keep on with this and we'll always be with you. If you want any of our opinions, we'll always give you opinions. And Arif, keep going. And we are always here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Thank, thank you. you, thank sir. you, Dr. Nia, sir. Now for our next topics, Jay, over to you. Yes, thank you, sir. So, and now let's go to the surgical management of strabismus fixus. I'm proud to present to you um, Dr. James Abraham Lee. Um, he also graduated from the Philippine General Hospital and then he proceeded to, to Rotterdam, Netherlands for further training in pediatric ophthalmology. He's now a consultant and a clinical associate professor at the Philippine General Hospital and his mentor, I, I'm sorry I, um, if we forgot to uh, change the name. This is Dr. Um, Joanne Bolinao. Um, she's a consultant at the American Eye Center. So, James, please share your slide. James, are you there? There. Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. James Lee, and I am from the Philippine General Hospital. Tonight, I'm going to present a case of strabismus fixus, which I saw back in 2016 during my first month of fellowship in the Philippine General Hospital. So this is the case of CG, a 71-year-old female, with a chief complaint of inward deviation of the left eye. Her history started two years prior to initial consult, when she noted that her left eye was progressively going inwards until it became permanent. There was no note of any trauma or significant symptoms during this time. Eight years prior to her consult, she underwent cataract surgery of the right eye at another institution where she was left a fake. Her past medical history include the use of spectacles since childhood with unrecalled refraction, a history of hypertension but with no history of cerebrovascular disease. On initial examination, her right eye had a visual acuity of 2040, which does not improve with pinhole, while her left eye can count fingers at one foot. Slit lamp examination shows form chambers on both eyes, a fake on the right, and a grade 3 cataract on the left. Fundus examination revealed til tilted discs for both eyes with peripapillary atrophy and myopic fundus changes. Manifest refraction despite aphakia on the right eye showed minus 3 diopter sphere with minus 3 diopter cylinder at axis 180. On extraocular muscle examination, there is note of almost no movement of the left eye in all gazes, while the right eye also shows an abduction deficit. Force duction testing was done and showed restriction on both eyes with more restriction on the left eye. An MRI of the orbits was requested which revealed elongated globes with irregular contour and a medial deviation. The rest of the findings were unremarkable for this patient. So we plan to do a Yokoyama procedure for this patient with medial rectus recession or a boto medial rectus Botox injection. So just to review and explain, the Yokoyama procedure was invented by Dr. Tsunaranu Yokoyama for patients who are high myopes with progressive esotropia. The elongated globe in these patients usually gets entrapped between the superior and the lateral rectus muscles, giving it the esotropic and the hypotropic position, as evident in this case. The procedure involves joining the inferior portion or the lateral portion of your superior rectus and the superior portion of your lateral rectus muscles to close the gap between the globe where uh, to close the gap where the globe protrudes. So these are the intraoperative pictures of our patient. Uh, we started by identifying and isolating the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscles as you see here in the pictures. Once we have identified the muscles, we, play, we place a Dacron suture, 5 non absorbable suture on the lateral portion of your superior rectus and the superior portion of the lateral rectus 10 millimeters from their insertions and the suture was fixed and tied together. At this point, the eye was still tight. No? So our consultant during this time uh, uh, told us to decide and decided to just do the medial recession at a later time and see how the eye would improve the alignment of the, how the surgery would improve the alignment of this eye. Uh, at this point, we were unable to try to um, isolate the medial rectus muscles and release it from its original insertion. So this was one day after the patient's uh, surgery. As you can see, it has already improved a little bit and already has uh, some kind of abduction after, after uh, combining the superior and the lateral rectus muscle. So this is, again, just a before and after of the surgery after one day. 
And actually, the patient was happy with the result, saying that at least she could now see the black part of her eye. We scheduled her for serial Botox ingestion to release the medial rectus muscle and a maximal MRE sessions once it, is, once it was easier for us to do so. However, this patient was lost to follow up and did not consult back after three months after her surgery. So here are just some learning points for this case. The first one is we have to manage patient expectations. It is important for you to know what the patient expects from the surgery so that you may temper these expectations that are not realistic. As for this patient, we already told her that the outcomes might not be as good as what we were expecting, that it might improve a bit, but it will not be perfect. And she understood it, went with the surgery, and was very happy with the result, despite it not going as expected. Number two, we always have to discuss the possibility of multiple or stage surgeries. Uh, I'm not sure in Bangladesh, but here in the Philippines, the financial aspect of doing surgery plays a huge factor. And most of the time, patients as well as doctors would want to do everything in one sitting. However, explaining that multiple surgeries are needed to produce the desired outcome is the safest and most efficient way patients would most of the uh, safest and most efficient way. And most of the time, patients would agree, especially in difficult cases like these, where outcomes are not always what we expect. And lastly, use imaging procedures as necessary. Although sometimes we tend to forego imaging procedures because of the cost and the extra step, imaging procedures actually give us a new perspective in difficult cases such as these. And it has an invaluable input as to how we approach our, surgical, our surgeries, you know, be it strabismus or other kinds of surgeries. So actually, that's it. And thank you very much for listening and for the opportunity to share this case with all of you. Thank you, James. And so now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Joanne Bolinao, um, James' mentor. So Dr. Bolinao is a uh, strain from the Jules Eye Institute in um, the U.S. And she's now an active consultant at the American Eye Center. Ma'am? Hi, good evening. Again, thank you, James, for sharing your experience with a difficult case of strabismus fixus. Hashtag, it's actually complicated. Well, preoperatively, I would agree Imaging would really be helpful in these type of cases. The coronal cut of your MRI would actually demonstrate the deviation of your superior rectus nasally and your inferior and your lateral rectus um, inferiorly. And that would have a consequent widening of the normal angle between the superior and lateral rectus. That would help you now plan what surgical step you would do next. So in terms of surgical ter technique, there are no right or wrong approach in any strabismus case. You will always have several techniques that you can choose from to address the problem as long as you know what to correct. Like in this case, you know that it's not the weak weakness of the lateral rectus. Rather, it's the pathologic path that um, opened up so that your globe protruded. And so by uniting the superior and the lateral rectus, you would correct the, you would normalize the pathological path of those two muscles. However, with the tight medial rectus, as you have demonstrated on your first doctrine, combining an MR recession with your myopexy may have offered more correction in this case. But again, totally nothing wrong if you want to stage the procedure. You, have, you could actually do it several times as, as long as you explain to the patient well what to expect beforehand and you establish that rapport with your patients, I don't think your patients will be mad at you after the procedure, after the surgery. So you under promise, over deliver. Thank you. And Mabuhay from the Philippines. Thank you, Dr. Bolinao. A shuffle? Thank you, Dr. Chen. Now, the moment we will hear from our chief guest, who needs no introduction? I always tell she is the mentor, she is the teacher of our teachers, and she is the chief patron of Bangladesh Young Ophthalmology Society, Professor Ava Hussain. Madam, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. It's an excellent session, amazing session. My heartfelt thanks goes to both the president, the Philippine president, uh, Dr. Uh, Tanlapko beautiful president Tanlapko and handsome president of BIOS, Dr. Ashraful. Really, the organizer has so nicely designed all the subspeciality almost. So there are special guests, three 
special guest, Dr. Sharman Valero. He is the first president of uh, Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology and Professor Shafuddin Ahmed is the president of Bangladesh Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh and he also is the regional secretary of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and he is the chairman of community ophthalmology in Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University and so many things he is busy always and he is a oculoplastic surgeon and Dr. Margaret Lakluna, she is the president of Filipino Academy of Ophthalmology. These three special guests has uh, given their uh, own speech and that was an excellent one. But I would be very happy to say there are six speakers and six panelists. And the thing has started uh, from Dr. Mohamed Maksud al Hassan, surgical management of ectectic cornea. He presented it so nicely. And Professor Abdul Kadir, he accepted his all the management. He said that uh, it is very difficult for treating this ectetic, uh, ectetic condition, but uh, Dr. Maksudul is treating the dark and also the collagen uh, cross-linking is uh, he and his team and all the cornea surgeons are doing this in Bangladesh. So this is an excellent presentation. Dr. Armida Sula, next speaker. She spoke on upper lid reconstruction with orbicularis and technique. This is an excellent presentation and she so showed how a mass, simple a mass, uh, thinking it as a benign, but it is not. It was not. It was a malignant, and she has already said how she did the orbicularis and this technique. And Dr. Alexander Tan has appreciated her management, and this is another good uh, presentation. Next speaker was Dr. Ruxanda. Raymuna. And the panelist is the Professor Nozrul Islam. Both are my students. I'm really so happy to see that uh, one question is always asked when the parents and when the teachers are happy. I always answer that when the kids are getting higher than the parents and the students are getting higher than the teacher. That is the um, happiest moment of the teacher. So today's all these speakers, though not my student, but uh, as the younger and uh, somebody are my student, I am thinking all are my students like that. So this was an excellent, uh, how difficult case, the white cataract, quite to the white cataract. So the way she is doing the capsulorexis in case of white solid, white uh, milky, um, uh, milky white cataract is very difficult for doing the capsulorexis, but she did it very nicely. And Professor Nozrul Islam also appreciated her uh, surgery and she also added some more point. So I will not go in details, but I would like to say all the speakers, as I have heard very minutely all the speakers' presentation. So I would like to thank them individually, both the panelists and the speaker. Next is the Dr. Jessa Protasio. This is another important topic, that is the blep dysthesia. It is a complication of the trabeculectomy surgery. So uh, she has seen uh, shown how she managed, that is, uh, First of all, she said that the intensive lubrication is very important and next is the compression suture is also very effective. And uh, Dr. Norman Akuno also accepted and she, he said something more about this uh, complication. And the Dr. Arif Hayat, that is the 
fractional retinal detachment main uh, thing is the management of the or the surgery of diabetic retinopathy which causes the fractional retinal detachment and retinal detachment was one of my very very favorite and i did so many retinal detachment surgery in my earlier time as because retinal detachment was my dissertation it was my dissertation and my mentor my teacher my boss my professor the pioneer of retinal detachment surgery retina surgery in bangladesh professor aqsm arun most probably your uh, teachers teachers that is grand teachers may know his name he was one of the excellent microsurgery also he was the pioneer in doing microsurgery technique so i am very feeling proud of my teacher and i am feeling proud of my student dr hayat he did so nicely he showed so nicely and dr niyaz abdul rahman the uh, panelist he was also my student so i feel very proud and they showed it very nicely thank you and last but not the least dr james abraham the surgical management of strabismus fixes very difficult case very difficult case uh, you know that when i have started my journey to uh, ophthalmology it was in 1981 most of you are not at that time i don't uh, know that uh, you were born or if you born then you are just uh, 2 3 4 5 years like that so at that time uh, with uh, at that time the thing we have to do all the thing that is the uh, from a to z that is cataract glaucoma uvitis cornea detachment of course the retina is uh, not possible everybody to do but anti segment surgery everybody is doing that thing so it is growing so fast technology is so fast and now where we stand that is we can fight against globally this asian country the, we are not in only the asian country we can fight globally with the american academy we can fight with the european uh, society we can fight with other i specialist of the world so dr james abraham has shown very nicely the management of strabismus fixus and uh, dr juan the panelist she also added some more technique so it was an excellent presentation six speaker was done very good and i am really feel so proud that you are the future star you are the main and we when we will much more older you are the surgeon you will do our surgery in our eye so we are feeling very comfortable very secure that my eyes will never be blind because of you you are here and you will do all these thing so professor abdul kader here and professor sharfuddin they are our leader that is the president and secretary general and i think uh, most of uh, special guest has left as because i know everybody is busy so thank you so very much everybody and thank you ashraf and again that beautiful uh, president of philippine uh, danlakko uh, so that you can physically uh, let covid the off after the vaccine will come uh, we will free and comfortable and go to each other country comfortably and very much in a healthy mood healthy way so we will do all this thing before that we will continue the webinar we will continue the uh, doctor Tanlapko has said initially that we will not 
uh, it changes our view but we will do always we will link each other and see with uh, professor sharfuddin has also said that we will continuously in a follow up the uh, thing which are in the um, in the patient's management that meticulous follow up uh, will make us will make the young generation updated in case of glaucoma in case of every subject that you should follow up the patient so that uh, there is any complication you can find that that thing uh, very nicely in the early phase in the early part of the uh, follow up being first day second day third day there are so many complication may happen so in this way if we follow up all the things with each other uh, in website in uh, whatsapp in uh, this sort of webinar we will be much more benefited everybody and the young generation of bangladesh and the young uh, ophthalmologist of philippine i think they will be uh, much more talented and they will fight with the global leader uh, in future i think so so with this few words i, I know that uh, the bios uh, member will run and attend american academy of ophthalmology uh, young uh, ophthalmologist meeting so uh, i will is very much careful that i will not take much time but i have some time more as because it is still not 7:30 so i will not take much more time only uh, say goodbye and thank you all from my core of my heart and please uh, be with us always and next year that is in 2021 i don't know what will happen in asia pacific region at that time uh, whether covid will read off or uh, again we will have a virtual meeting but uh, from uh, august 1st to august 5th there will be the apo conference and on that day uh, i will take the charge of president of asia pacific academy of ophthalmology so uh, philippine is with us in the asia pacific region and all other country also and bangladesh of course and if possible we will go to uh, malaysia and physically if possible we will go and attend the conference and i'll take at that time the charge with this few words thank you so much be stay happy stay healthy stay safe and my heartfelt thanks to all of you thank you so much thank you madam thank you professor abha hussain i always tell that when i talk with professor abha hussain and professor sharfuddin ahmed basically when i get chance to talk with them i always learn something so thank you for being with us now uh, this is the end of the session i would like to invite dr chetan lepko for concluding the session che over to you thank you ashrafal today we have featured amazing work by our yaws from bangladesh and the philippines we'd like to thank our mentors and their, for their tireless commitment to teach our generation please be assured that we'll do the same for the next so ladies and gentlemen there you have it our first and hopefully not the last bios pinoy joint webinar um we thank our honorable apao president uh, dr hussein and our respective special guests panelists and of course our speakers and every one of you for tuning in thank you so much and good night thank you thank, thank you, you very much thank you thank, thank you, you.